Lord, help. Thank you. All right. Um, so we're, we're coming to the end of Philippians here, and um, that's the best prayer there is, isn't it? It's, it kind of sums it all up, and I need a lot. Uh, okay, so imagine for a second. It's 60 A.D. Uh, imagine this. It's 60 A.D. It's about 25 years after Paul has had that amazing experience on the Damascus Road where the risen Christ has appeared to him. And, of course, Paul asks the right question, who are you, Lord? And the response totally, radically revolutionizes his life. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Well, 25 years later, Paul is in prison. He's in Rome, and he's under house arrest, He's getting ready to uh, be tried before the Roman Emperor Nero, who's a total maniac, and nobody knows what the outcome is going to be. And Paul is facing the potential that he might be put to death, which he's talked about earlier in the epistle. You know, all of those uh, missionary journeys that are recorded in Acts have been completed. Um, You know, he's there in Rome. And as he's awaiting trial, God uses him in ways I'm sure he never could have imagined that probably he is used more by putting him in prison than if he would have been out on the road again because he's a very busy guy and maybe he wouldn't have had time to sit down and write a few letters that he never could have imagined you and I would be studying today as ways to understand the Christian life. And from prison, he writes a couple of letters. They're known as the prison epistles. And one of those, of course, he writes to his dear friends in the Macedonian city of Philippi, which actually is pronounced Philippi, uh, but I'll go with Philippi because most of you still know that anyway. That has nothing to do with anything, but there you go. Anyway. I kept, did you hear this story? I kept asking, I can't get off track again. Never mind. Okay. Um, so imagine, so imagine you're part of that group. Okay. You're, you're part, well, imagine we're that little church that gathers together in Philippi. And what happens is that the overseer, the episkopos, who the letter is addressed to, two interchangeable words used in the New Testament, presbyteros, where we get our word Presbyterian from, which literally means elder, who was the spiritual leader of the church, but interchangeably, sometimes they were referred to, as Paul does in Philippians, as the episkopos, which means overseer, kind of a shepherd. And so uh, basically the pastor of the church gets up. You're all gathered around. You know Paul. You have, you, you've supported him in all of his ministry, and, and now you get this letter from him. You're probably a little anxious about him, frankly, which is what we're going to talk about this morning, because you don't want him to be put to death. I mean, you're, you're worried about him. And, uh, but so he writes this letter, and we're gathered together, and, uh, and the, the episcopos, the pastor, begins to read the letter, and imagine he's just read all the way up to where we are. So he's read through those first three, three chapters, and, and what he's just finished is that passage, of course, where Paul uh, kind of challenged them and through them, us, to have that same level of intensity in their pursuit of spiritual growth as, as Paul has so that you might experientially know Jesus better. And probably, by the way, um, the la- this verse, which is the first verse in chapter 4, should probably go at the end of chapter 3 because I, I think it really rounds it out. And remember, there are no chapters, verses, and all of that. It's just a letter you know, that's being read and probably read in whole at one time. And, and Paul writes after that challenge, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Now, in a sense, I think he's come to the end of sort of the train of thought that has been in those first three chapters, and, and I, I feel like this is kind of the end of that, and so at the end of the letter, what he does is he fires off a whole series of kind of uh, exhortations to the believers there in, uh, in uh, Philippi, and um, what I'm going to do is not what's in your bulletin, which I, I have to tell 
Ken something to put in the bulletin early in the week when I have no idea what I'm going to talk on. So I make them up, and I'm not going to talk about it. What I was going to do is kind of hit three of these that he gives there, and the more I started kind of working on it, the more I felt like I was really supposed to zero in on one of these exhortations that he gives. But let's read just a few of these verses where he's kind of firing off a series of exhortations to the believers. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Great little passage, kind of a classic text, by the way. I want to do something this morning, and I hope you have something to write notes with because I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to do a quick exercise here. So take your little you know, bulletin handout, and, uh, and what I want you to do on that there on the note side, is I just want you to draw a line all the way across the page. I mean, you don't have to have the little arrows on the end of it, but, you know, just this little line across, somewhere across your page there. And, uh, and then what I want you to do is uh, on one end of that line, I want you to write never, and on the other end of the line, I want you to write always, because what you are creating for yourself is a worry meter, okay? You're going to have your own worry meter today, and again, so never over here on the one side and always on the, uh, on the other. Now, I-, I want you to take a minute and just think about how much you worry, how anxious you are about things, and nobody's going to see this except you, and what I want you to do is I want you to put an X on this scale somewhere along the line that would kind of evaluate where you think you are in terms of the issue of worrying. I mean, probably, you know, uh, now, you know, we'll put one right in the middle. This isn't me, by the way. Uh, I I actually am off the worry meter on the right side somewhere. But, uh, you know, anyway, but some of it, you know, we're we're all somewhere kind of in between. We're kind of in between these two guys, okay? You know, on the one hand, it's you never worry, and on the other hand, you're just always a wreck or something, okay? And uh, so, anyway, we're going to create a little worry meter here. So, um, it, it's interesting because one of the things, along with, as I've been studying Philippians, I've also been studying that book on happiness and, and how all of these ideas really kind of you know, fit together with joy and the way Paul expresses it. And again, it, it, the, part of the reason that we're going to be all different places on the worry meter is that in the same way that our sort of baseline happiness quotient is somewhat they say 50% determined genetically so that we all kind of come into the world and some, some of you are sunny side up and, you know, some of, some of us are just, you know, we got to work real hard at, you know, being happy campers. And, and, uh, but some of that is so, some of that's just the way that you're wired. And I, I think the same thing is probably true in terms of anxiety. I, I think by nature, some people tend to be more anxious and others just kind of, you know, seem to take things in stride and be a little bit more calm. But regardless of where you are on that spectrum, in the same way that there are things that you can do to increase your joy level or your happiness level, um, I believe that what we see in this text is that there are some things that we can do that actually will m- m- move that X at least down a bit toward that uh, never side. And, uh, and you have some things that you can do that control how much you worry in your life. Now, only the Holy Spirit can change you and me. We can do certain things, though, that either facilitate growth that the Holy Spirit is trying to do in our life, or we can do things that impede growth 
And last week, we just briefly looked at those obstacles that Paul, you know, threw out there. But Paul here gives this little strategy uh, for overcoming anxiety. And what I'm going to do is take this text, and and I'm just going to break it down. Uh, I I, I actually don't like doing steps, three steps, but I'm going to do three steps. Because I'm just going to take this apart and, and look at what does Paul say here? that we can apply in our own life to, uh, to deal with anxiety. And the first step I'm simply going to say is that, that we need to be able to identify when we are being anxious. Again, th- this is the classic text. And uh, where, what Paul says here, uh, usually it, uh, it's translated a number of different ways. Usually translated as do not either be anxious or do not worry, but the word that is used that we translate as worry or anxiety is this little Greek word, merimna. And the significance of the word is it is a word that really does carry a little bit more weight than simply talking about something that we're concerned about. Uh, You know, there's this kind of Uh, thin line somewhere out there that separates uh, legitimate concern from worry and anxiety. And, you know, I never know when I cross it, but, you know, it's there. And this word deals with when you've kind of crossed over into this this area where it's more than care. Um, it, It actually can be excessive, and sometimes it's un founded. It's interesting. Uh, in the Hebrew, the, the equivalent word meant to carry a burden. So it's like you've taken something on yourself, and, and the result is it's creating this anxiety in you. Uh, in the English dictionary, um, anxiety, well, that's, I don't know how I got, that slide doesn't look good, does it? Um, here's how the English Dictionary, Webster's defines anxiety, painful or apprehensive uneasiness of mind, usually over an impending or anticipated ill. Now, if that isn't enough for you, here's the the larger definition. And I, I want to do this one simply because there are some things in here that are important. An abnormal and overwhelming sense of apprehension and fear, often marked by physiological signs such as sweating, tension, increased pulse, by doubt concerning the reality and nature of the threat, and by self-doubt about one's capacity to cope with it. It's a form of fear, is what anxiety is, and, and it, really it, uh, th- there's part of that that uh, we can't even control. Um, for, for instance, you know, most people would say that anxiety, again, being a form of fear, um, is sort of hooked into what is called our flight or fight mechanism. And that is that when we encounter danger, um, certain things happen automatically in our life. Um, one thing is, is that uh, when we experience or we think we're going to experience danger, and anxiety is true of this, you know, insulin actually uh, our brain starts to pump more insulin uh, into our muscle system. If you were being anxious and someone were to get up real close and look at you, your pupils will have actually dilated. Your heart rate will increase. And there are a number of other chemicals that, that get released into your bloodstream. There's a physiology that goes along with anxiety that, again, is hooked into fear. Now, here's the problem. That system was kind of designed uh, by God for when you and I would be confronted with like a tiger, all right? And, uh, you know, if suddenly you were walking along and, you know, and there, there was a tiger in the sidewalk, it happens a lot to me. I don't know about you. No, just kidding. Anyway, there's a tiger in the sidewalk. Well, suddenly all of these mechanisms would kick into gear and we would experience a level of anxiety, but it would be well-founded. The problem is in the modern world, that tiger is called the future, all right? And the thing that we get anxious about are our fear or worry about something we think that might happen that we aren't really quite sure we can handle, all right? And so all of these things are going on in our life, but oftentimes they are unfounded and the significance of that 
particularly in light of, I think, the book of Philippians, is that anxiety kills joy. You, you just can't be anxious and joyful at the same time. Now, the, the good news is this. Joy diminishes or diffuses anxiety. And again, th- there, there are two things that just don't work together. And, and so Paul is trying to give us some tips then about, again, how do, we, how do we diffuse that when we begin to experience it? And so he begins by giving the exhortation. Do not be anxious about anything. Now, uh, the reason I put stop being in there, and, and I think these little things are important, is that really what the text says in terms of the grammar of it is that. In other words, they are experiencing anxiety. And he's saying, stop. And I would suggest to you, again, that how you stop begins with asking, first of all, simply recognizing, I'm anxious. Okay? So we recognize something is going on internally, and we're anxious, and I think that in terms of identifying that, one of the things we should do immediately when we're feeling that is to ask the question, what is making me anxious? Why am I anxious? I'm going to identify the fact that I am, but what is it? And usually we know what it is uh, that is creating that, and what, what, I, what I think will be very helpful for you if this is an issue you struggle with is once you identify that you are anxious in what you're identified about, write it down. Now, I keep a journal in my quiet times, and I write a lot of things. I write down uh, the text of Scripture, you know, things that I find out of the passage that I'm reading that I think are important. Uh, I kind of journal my prayer time, and oftentimes when there are things that are going on in my life that are uh, creating anxiety, I, I write those down to pray about them. So, I find that to be a helpful beginning point in terms of dealing with it, that I identify it and and I write it down. So here's what I want you to do. On your worry meter right now, I want you to go back to your worry meter, and I just want you to write one thing down that you are anxious about. I mean, and if you aren't anxious about anything, uh, you can leave now. No, just kidding. (laughs) Just kidding. All right. But think about it, because most of us have something we're anxious about. So I just thought about, I have been, I have been very anxious about the building. Now, you, you probably know that, because I've, I've shared it before. But just for the sake of uh, illustration, I write that down. Write something down. And by the way, notice where now my ex has moved <laughs> to about that. And uh, things have changed, though. I'm getting much less anxious. Now I'm finding other things to be anxious about. So, no. All right. So, so, so this is step one. Write it down, and we're going to come back to this, but write down one thing that you, you're anxious about. So in this beginning step, you've identified your anxious and what you're anxious about. It is interesting, by the way, um, one of the things that I was reading on this, and I can't even remember where I picked this up this week, but it was talking about dealing with anxiety, and it, and it said what you should do is you, you write down a list of the things, if there's multiple things you're anxious about, and then take that list and put it aside and decide, I'm going to worry about that later, which is an interesting approach. But for right now, let's just say you take one thing, okay, you put the others aside that are, you know, you're anxious about, and, and we're going to zero in and deal with one issue that you're anxious about. So you're ready for step two once you've gotten to that point, and of course, step two is pray. Now, Let's look at how Paul expresses this. Stop being anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. In that one little sentence, he uses three different words that communicate the idea of prayer. Uh, One of them is just kind of the more general word. The first word that's translated here, prayer, is the Greek word prosuka, which is just sort of a a broader or a general word for prayer. So uh, part of what Paul is saying is that when we are anxious, we should simply pray. And prayer, prayer more than anything, um, it's like we shift a gear 
And we're, we're functioning here primarily consciously, again, in sort of a, uh, you know, the, the material world that we're operating in. But we know that we have access uh, into communication and relationship with God who's always there even when we're not conscious of it. And what happens in prayer is we stop and we consciously get into contact with God. Now, in a broader sense, it's interesting because even not, not specifically getting to anxiety, but one of the things that strikes me is the way that Jesus teaches us to pray. And it's been five years, I think, now since I taught this uh, at Highline. But, uh, you know, Jesus gives this pattern in the Lord's Prayer of how to pray when the disciples come to him and ask him to teach us to pray. And, and when I teach through that, one of the things I point out is that uh, there are like uh, seven elements that Christ teaches at, that you can break down out of the Lord's Prayer. And, and the whole first half of the Lord's Prayer has virtually uh, very little to do with us. It's all about getting focused on God. Think about this. So when you pray, pray this way. Father, so first of all, you're, you're consciously entering into relationship with God. And by the way, it was radical to begin with praying Father. Th- those guys didn't do that before. I mean, you know, you go through the entire Old Testament, you'll not find one time that anyone ever addresses God as Father. Because it's through our relationship with Christ that we enter into that kind of a role where we come to him. And not only as Father, we come to him as Abba. It really means that we approach God. The Spirit within us enables us to basically come to God as, as Papa or Daddy. I mean, it's a, it's a term of endearment. But anyway, we, we consciously enter in. And then Christ said, the, the next thing he breaks down is, he says, uh, when you pray, pray, hallowed be your name. In other words, the first thing we should do after kind of establishing contact is to, uh, is to focus on who God is. Okay. Hallowed be your name. And again, in, when I teach this or in, in the book I wrote on it, um, I, I take the name of God, which is Yahweh. God has revealed himself. He's, given, he's revealed his name to Moses back in Exodus chapter 3. And, and one of the things, and then throughout the Old Testament, he reveals more of himself by taking his name Yahweh and then uh, creating compound uh, a compound name that has Yahweh and then some dimension of who he is. Probably the classic one being uh, Yahweh Yira, which we transliterate as uh, Jehovah Jireh. You've probably heard that, which literally means the Lord will provide. And part of God's nature is that he's a provider, and so he reveals himself. But the name of God itself is fascinating, because the name of God, which he, he says, he reveals himself as I am that I am. This is my name, Yahweh in Hebrew, four Hebrew consonants, I, that means I am, to be, to exist. And commentators tend to think, well, that, that can mean one of three different things. And one thing is it can simply mean that he is saying, I am the God who is. I exist. I am that I am. I'm real. I exist. The God who is. But then there's a way that it could be translated in what's called the causative sense. And if that's what is being implied, and it's totally a judgment call, by the way, on commentators, and it could be translated, I will be, wait, I'm, no, let me go back, I am the one who causes to be, in the sense of he is, he's the creator. All that exists, exists because he has brought it into being. Okay, that's a second kind of a sense. And then the third possibility is that it, he, it could be translated as I will be who I will be, which is a statement I think about his sovereignty. This is who I am. I'm going to be who I am. And so you put those things together, and, and here's where I'm getting to. It, if you pray the way Christ tells you and take seriously praying about the fact that God... You are the God who is, you cause to be, you're sovereign, you'll be who you will be. If we allow that to sink into our consciousness, it will attack anxiety before you're even thinking about your anxiety. 
I mean, are you aware of this? Because what happens, I find, and I think this is why we need to pray consistently on a daily basis and pray the way that Jesus taught, because what happens is we begin to remember who God is. I mean, think about this. And I know, I, think about this. If God really exists, I mean, if we believe God really exists, which is what we probably are here about this morning for most of us, huh? And, and if we believe he's actually involved in the affairs of men, that, that he actually cares about us, where should our worry meter be? Where should the X be? All right? You can know. Now, now, now just one second. Don't worry about that, okay? <laughs> because cause really, if you start worrying about how much you worry, it only gets worse, you know? And I know people that worry about worrying. So don't worry about where it should be. And, and, and again, don't should on yourself, okay? Uh, I should do this. I should, you know, that's a, that's a good kind of spiritual principle anyway. Um, so, you know, don't go around saying, I shouldn't worry so much, okay? But, but again, simply bringing into our consciousness the reality of who God is and connecting with him, simply generally praying should have an impact upon anxiety uh, in our life. But Paul goes on. He doesn't just say pray about everything. He says by prayer and petition. Now, this is interesting because petition is the word that talks about that part of our prayer life where we ask God for things. And if you go back again and carefully look at the Lord's Prayer and how Jesus taught us to pray, having spent adequate time in getting into contact, worshiping Him uh, by hallowing His name, uh, relinquishing our, our lives to Him by, again, saying, you know, your kingdom come, your will be done, not my will, but your will. All of that, you know, takes some time And it gets us into the right frame of mind to then begin to say, by the way, there's some things I want to ask you about. And so then, the second half of the Lord's Prayer is all petition. It really is. Give us this day our daily bread. Uh, Don't lead us into temptation. You know, forgive us our sins. It's it's very specific petition. And so, in in terms of anxiety, then what you want to do is you've made a list. You've listed the things that are creating anxiety. And so, by petition individually pray about each one of those things. By the way, this was, again, what Yahweh means. I am the one who is, I am the one who causes to be, and I am the one who will be what I will be. So, um, so you begin to pray specifically about the issues that you know, are creating anxiety in your life. Now, as you pray about those things, ask God for wisdom. Because one of the things you begin to become aware of is that sometimes we're anxious about things that we can do something about. And so, you know, one of the things we can pray about is that God would show us, you know, what, what, can, I, what can I do? Which is important to tackle these one at a time. Because some things you're going to say, I have no control whatsoever over that particular issue. And you just you, you got to give it to God. But there are some things. And what happens oftentimes is that we get so paralyzed by anxiety that we do nothing about anything. And one of the things I think that can happen as we pray about it is God can give us the, the idea of, you know, how do, I, how do I just tackle one thing? And then, again, as we're praying about these things, uh, trying to kind of sort through those issues. Now, uh, by the way, and I, I don't know, I, I, this might be out of context, but notice what Paul says, though, about this. What are we to pray about? What are we to be anxious about? Anything we, we are to pray about, and in everything we're to pray about it. You know, sometimes I, you know, sometimes I think the stuff that I pray about is so insignificant. And I have people say to me, well, I'm not, I don't pray about that because God's got, you know, he's got so much other stuff to do. Hey, God is God. You know, here's the deal. He can handle it all, all right? He can handle the smallest issue in our life, and he can handle the biggest issue in our life. And so you're told, th- this is not like, this is like instruction. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, 
with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So we, we pray about it, and we identify those issues. But I was just going to go back to say many of you are familiar uh, with what's called the serenity prayer. And uh, actually, uh, usually the credit for the serenity prayer is given to a German theologian by the name of Reinhold Niebuhr. I'm sure that you can go back, and I've seen historically all the way back to Socrates' statements that are very similar to this, but this became quite well known because it, in 1941, and, and uh, you know, trying to figure it out, it looks as early as the mid-30s, Niebuhr had preached and taught this, and the earliest record of it is in actually a book by one of his students that quotes him in 1940, and quotes the serenity prayer, but in 1941, Alcoholics Anonymous adopted this as part of the 12-step program. And of course, it's classic because this is what we're doing as we pray. God, grant me the serenity to accept what can't be changed and the courage to change what can be changed and the wisdom to know one from the other. So as you're praying about the issue that's creating anxiety, is this an issue I can actually take steps to overcome, or is this something that's completely beyond my control? By the way, when Niebuhr himself finally wrote the prayer in one of his books, here's how he wrote it. O God and Heavenly Father, grant us a serenity of mind to accept that which can't be changed, courage to change that which can be changed, and wisdom to know the one from the other through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It's a little different, you know, than the other. But again, you get, you get a sense. He's, he's in relationship with Jesus, and he's, you know, and he's praying through, you know, what, you know, what can I do something about? What can't I do something about? Now, in the midst of this little prayer. So step two, as we pray, I think, <laughs> I think I'm going to call this that there's a secret ingredient. You know, uh, I was trying to think of all the different things that have secret ingredients. I know Kentucky Fried Chicken has some kind of a secret ingredient, right? Coke has some secret ingredient. I, there's all kinds of things. Well, I think there's something here that I have overlooked and blown by for years. And that is this idea that as we pray, and as we petition, we're also supposed to engage in what? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Now, this was kind of interesting because while I was working again on the text, and as I was reading again on kind of the whole happiness and joy thing, one of the things that is an exercise to, that you can do to enhance your joy and happiness in life is to practice gratitude. Now, I know this sounds so simple, doesn't it? But scientists have now validated that that actually works. That as you express gratitude, the level of your happiness increases. And so in this, you know, secular book that I'm reading while I'm studying Philippians, it gives an exercise. And what it says is, write down five things you're grateful for. And they actually did a study on this, okay? And, and, and it's really fascinating. I don't know how to completely process all of this, but they had three test groups. And they had one group that they were testing, you know, their level of, you know, happiness, etc. And they didn't do anything. And then they had a test group where they had uh, once a week, they had them write down the things, five things you're grateful for. And then they had another group that they had do it every day. And the interesting thing was that the group that actually experienced the greatest level was the group that only did it once a week. And what their conclusion was is if you do it every day, it kind of becomes just like a rote habit. But if you do it once a week and you really think about it, okay, that, that as you are being thankful, uh, and, you know, you can take that for what it's worth. But again, that it really works. Well, what is Paul saying here? And and I'm going to suggest a little different twist on this because I've always said, well, it means that whatever you're praying about, you should be thankful for, even if it's something that is really hard. And and maybe you're not thankful for the thing itself, but you're thankful, you know, that God cares about it and you can pray about it. But what if what Paul is saying is that as you pray, part of what you should do is stop and be thankful. Think about something you're thankful for. So, So, again... 
here, let, let me have you actually do something. Look at your worry meter, and under it, you've written something that you're anxious about, that you prayed about, but under that, why don't you write one, take a minute and write one thing that you are grateful for. And again, in the same way that joy and anxiety can't coexist, I think part of what God is kind of saying here is that gratitude and anxiety can't coexist. And one of the ways of dealing with anxiety is to simply stop and consciously think about what are some things I'm grateful for and see if that doesn't diffuse your anxiety. Now, seriously, as I was thinking about this, I have been so grateful for the amazing generosity that you guys have exhibited that it has taken my worry meter way down. Probably not as good as what I've put there, but, you know, I wanted you to think I was doing really well, so I put that there. But, <laughs> no, but I'm just grateful, and I have this gratitude. Well, it didn't have to even be that. I could have been, you know, grateful for something completely unrelated, and yet this idea is that as we pray, we integrate into that gratitude. So pray, petition with thanksgiving, and then the third step, and I'll finish up quickly with this. Um, aren't you glad I only picked one thing instead of three this morning? Okay, all right. Um, it, it's simple. I'm going to say is this. Receive peace. Be open to the peace of God uh, as you pray about these things. And, and Paul says it this way. If you do this, that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding or is beyond comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I immediately thought of another verse that Paul wrote. I already sent Biff my slide, so I don't have a slide on it. But, but it's interesting. He, when Paul writes his letter to the Colossians, and you might write this text and go look at it, Colossians 3.15, he says to the Colossians, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Now, in that text... This text has a, an image of a sentinel standing guard. So when he says that the peace of God will guard your hearts, he uses a military term. It's as if someone is standing guard over your heart and your mind. And in Colossians, he uses an athletic term. It really means let the peace of Christ be the umpire in your mind. So again, think about that in terms of anxiety. It's like, wait a second. You know, is this even something I should be worrying about? Or, Lord, I'm going to give this up to you. But, but peace is something, apparently, we need to actually open ourselves up to. All right? Let the peace of Christ. And so, peace then, I'm saying receive peace. Let the peace. And it's a great word picture, again. Um, peace here, probably, although the text is written in Greek, the idea behind it is probably the idea of God's shalom, which again is much larger than our concept of peace being the end of hostilities. It, it really meant overall, a sense of overall well-being, the shalom of God. And so let that uh, you know, become the, the sentinel. And interesting, isn't it, that what that guards is our hearts and our minds. What happens when we allow anxiety to run rampant? You know what? For many of us, you know what happens. Immediately, you go to the worst possible outcome. Oh, my gosh. I, I should, I, you know, Allison's not here because she's sick, and I could tell a story on her, but I, I probably shouldn't. He should I? But, you know, I, the first time our son was sick, she said, oh, my God, I'm never going to have grandkids. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that is an amazing, you know. You know, and, and, and we're all like that. Don't tell her I said that, okay? All right, anyway. But don't, we allow our minds, if you don't stop, you, you know, your minds go crazy and then your emotions get wacky. And so what the text says is it's as if the peace of God wants to guard you, guard the way you think and the way you feel, okay, in Christ Jesus. And, uh, and pragmatically, again, uh, uh, you think about Paul, it, it transcends comprehension. So you can actually have a peace that makes absolutely no sense in your given situation. Does Paul's situation, does having peace in his situation make any sense? I don't think so. He's getting ready to maybe die. 
And yet, he, he's so tuned in and in the groove that he's having joy and peace. And how about when they arrested him in this, Philippi? It's where they arrested him, beat him up, threw him in jail. And what did they do? They sang hymns and prayed, and God blew the doors off. Does that make any sense? It doesn't logically make sense. And because God can do things that don't make sense. And he can give us peace in the midst of situations that the logical thing is for us to be panicked about. So peace, let peace. Let, let me just close with this. Um, you probably have heard these statistics, but I thought it would be worth just firing at us again. Uh, again, the earliest reference to this I can find, because it gets used a lot, and I've never really referenced it before, but, but there, uh, uh, the story goes that, again, this is about in the 1940s, that a... Uh, uh, a theologian, a Bible teacher at Oberlin College uh, by the name of Thomas Kepler, I had a woman come to him um, who was so, um, she, her fears, she, her anxieties and her fears were literally ruining her life. And what Kepler did is uh, he had her begin to keep track of the things that she was anxious about and as she began to keep track of those things, uh, he began to have her categorize them. And the outcome, which now, again, I, you know, I don't know if this is scientifically validated or not, but the, the statistics get used a lot. They're certainly worth thinking about. The outcome was this. She worried, 40% of the things she worried about would never have happened anyway. And so there's a certain amount of things we worry about that worry is really wasted energy because they're never going to happen anyway. 30% of the things she worried about were things that had already happened. So we'd have to think about it a bit, but we probably have anxiety and worry about something in the past. But again, it's under, I think the word he used was water under the bridge, okay? So, and then 12% of her anxieties were being created by what other people thought or said about her. And, uh, and then he goes on to say, well, you know, usually people that criticize you are either jealous of you or insecure, and therefore you should, you should count that criticism as a compliment. But nonetheless, you know, 12%. And then 10% was about health issues that, you know, that she didn't have yet. So whether or not she would ever have that health issue. So at the end of the day, what they discovered was that out of everything she was worried about, only 8% were really things that legitimately... Uh, should cause concern. And I would imagine if you and I could get down to 8%, you know, that our worry meter would look a whole lot different than it does now. And the way we get down to it is pretty simple. We identify our anxiety, and in everything, we, we pray about it. Uh, we, we specifically pray about the issues, and we practice thanksgiving, and then we really allow the peace of Christ to come. And Final point, repeat as necessary. All right? All right. Let's pray. Lord, by nature, uh, many of us, I think, are probably uh, worriers and anxious. And uh, I know that we live in a world that is so filled with crazy things that we could spend our whole life uh, simply uh, in a state of, of anxiety. And, and Lord, you don't want that. You really want us to be men and women that have peace, uh, even in the midst of difficulties. And Lord Jesus, you're the one. You said that you give us peace, and uh, not like the world gives, but your peace is something that is beyond our ability to even understand. And Lord, help us just very pragmatically uh, take the instruction that Paul gives us here. And when things uh, begin to uh, be uh, worries and concerns and anxieties, help us to, uh, to stop and uh, identify that and, and then to, to pray, Lord. And, uh, and as we pray, to be grateful and think of things to be grateful for. And, and Lord, we pray that we would experience the peace that Paul talks about here and that you would guard our hearts and our minds uh, in Christ. And that we by being peaceful in the midst of difficult times, would actually bring glory to you, Christ, and uh, that you would be lifted up and exalted. In your name we pray. Amen.